Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins, heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. We want to welcome you to Union Street. We are so glad that you have welcomed us into your homes. We, we find it a great privilege to be able to come together, to worship together, to be in the word together, to be encouraged. And this morning, that is our prayer, that you would be encouraged, that you would feel connected to community, to know that you are not alone. One of the ways that you can continue following us is as you're doing this morning, uh, that you're on our Facebook page, that we go live every Sunday morning at 1030. But also on YouTube, if you're not able to connect early in the morning, on Sunday morning, we upload it to the YouTube page later on. And we want to thank you for faithfully giving to our church, that we are really really grateful how you continue to partner with us through e-transfers for mailing in your envelopes all those things that we just want to thank you this morning i want to pray for you let's let's bow our heads together dear heavenly father we thank you that you are indeed with us we thank you, God, that as a community that we are gathered together in your name. That whether we are here meeting in person or online, that you are with us. Nothing can separate us from you. God, we thank you how your presence gives us peace and gives us power. How your Holy Spirit encourages us, comforts us, and strengthens us. Dear Heavenly Father, you know the needs of each person that is gathered together online. I pray through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would meet each one. And as a community, may we be attentive to your voice so that we would encourage one another whether it's a phone call, whether it's dropping a note in the mail, dropping a meal off or cookies, whatever it may be, God, may we be attentive to your voice. We continue to pray for strength and wisdom for our hospital staff. We recognize that they are weary. We thank you that we can call upon your holy name and that we can exchange our weakness for your strength. We think of our teachers and the staff that are working at our local schools and all the complex issues that they're facing with teaching online and in person. And God, again, we recognize that they are weary, that they are discouraged. May as parents and community, may we gather around them to encourage our teachers and our EAs. May we pray regularly for our local schools, for our teachers, for our principals. We thank you, God, again for your righteous right hand that strengthens us. We thank you that you are for us and that you are fighting on our behalf. So God, as we sing this next song, Lord, I need you. I pray for whoever is watching and engaging online this morning that they would know your love, your compassion, your mercy, that you desire for each one of us to come to you, to be real with you, to bring whatever our needs are to you. And through the power of your Holy Spirit, you meet each and every one of them. So this morning, we come together praying and believing God. 
that you sustain us, that you are a sovereign Lord, that Jesus is our Savior, always our present help. So we thank you in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, uh, Union Street. Uh, it's really good to be able to be here with you this morning, to be able to share uh, with you in your living rooms, in your kitchens, or wherever you may be watching us. Uh, I'm really happy to be able to be here with you. For those of you who don't know, uh, my name is Garth Williams. I had the privilege of pastoring here for about 12 and a half years uh, back in the early 2000s, which in some way it seems like eons ago. Uh, and I'm here helping Angela out this morning. Uh, she uh, had the opportunity for her Aunt Lainey to go into a nursing care facility this past week, and so I offered to help lift some of the burden, because as many of you who have done something uh, similar to that, you know the weight that it can be uh, going into that season of life. And so I'm happy to be here, and I think then Angela has a week of vacation coming up, and so I'm then uh, going to be with you next week as well. So I hope that that hasn't caused you to turn off your a streaming device that you'll stick around both today as well as next week. So this week in the Williams House has been a really momentous week. 
Uh, some of you may be aware that Heather has announced uh, her retirement, and she's going to be wrapping up uh, as the principal at Milltown Elementary School this coming June. And so it's been quite a time as we've been processing that through and working through some of the implications of that. And uh, rest assured, she has many things to do. She has many projects that she's got on the go, and she's quite excited about this new chapter in her life. But one of the questions that we've gotten as we've some family and friends, has been, what's next for us? Are we going to be moving? Are we going to be selling our house? Are we going to be closer to our boys? What's, what's our thinking process at this stage? And you know, it's been quite a journey for us to be able to try to understand what it is that God wants for us to do. And so in the midst of that, we've just taken some time to kind of uh, try to figure that out and go before God in prayer and allow him to lead. And as of yet, we don't have any clarity on and as we've processed this through, it's really brought to me a phrase uh, that has really kind of echoed into my soul in these days. And it's the notion of going to the crossroads. So there's this imagery in our culture as well as within scripture about pulling aside to be able to hear God speak, of going to a place where you've got decisions to make, of going to the crossroads and waiting to kind of see what's going to happen and what's going to develop. In these days, I find that increasingly, we're all seeking to make decisions, that we've all got questions that we want resolutions to, and that we all, in some way, maybe need to go to the crossroads. I mean, this is very similar to uh, scripture waitings as well. From the time of Moses leading the Israelites through the desert, waiting 40 years to get to the promised land, uh, the example of Jesus going out into the wilderness to spend time alone with God, waiting for clarity and direction as to what to go ne and do next. Uh, to those in the early church who waited upon the Holy Spirit to come upon them after Jesus had left and returned to the Father in heaven. And then for the church now who waits for the triumphal return of Christ, as proclaimed in Scripture. And as we wait, we go to the crossroads, we go to this place where we wait upon God for clarity. One of the greatest scriptures that speak to this is Jeremiah 6. And in Jeremiah 6, you have this prophet Jeremiah, who's God's asked to try to wake up those who are his children, to grab their attention. The nation of Israel had fallen away from God. They were doing their own thing, and God asked Jeremiah to be his spokesperson to wake them up so that they would respond and that they would hear him once again. And so hear the words of Jeremiah chapter 6, beginning at verse 9. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Let them glean the remnant of Israel as thoroughly as a vine. Pass your hand over the branches, gain like one another gathering grapes. To whom can I speak and give warning? Who will listen to me? Their ears are closed, so they cannot hear. The word of the Lord is offensive to them. They find no pleasure in it. But I am full of the wrath of God, and I cannot hold it in. Pour it out on the children in the streets and on the young men gathered together. Both husband and wife will be caught in it. And the old, those weighed down with years... Their houses will be turned over to others together with their fields and their wives. When I stretch out my hand against those who live in the land, declares the Lord. From the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. Prophets and priests alike all practice deceit. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, where there is no peace. Are they ashamed of their loathsome conduct? No, they have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush. So they will fall among the fallen. They will be brought down when I punish them, says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. Here in the life of Israel, 
They've gone and they're doing their own thing. God sent reminding them of who God is and what his desire is for their life. And they ignore attention. They seek instead to please themselves. They have lost all sense of shame. And so God says there's a time coming. And before that time comes, I want you to go to the crossroad. I want you to look. I want you to ask for the ancient paths. I want you to find the good way and walk in it. I think that's the same invitation to you and I. In our season of wondering, in our season of trying to figure these things out, in this season of decision-making for all of us, that invitation that God gave to the children of Israel is there for you and I today. That invitation to come to the crossroads and look. You know, I got to I got to be honest. When I think about this notion of crossroads, I'm a kid who grew up in St. John, New Brunswick. Our roads were simply where the old cart paths were. They're not gridded. They're not lined out. I'm not even so sure the city fathers and mothers of St. John had any thought about how to lay a road or where to put it. And then, as I married a girl from Ontario, and we've gone back and we visited her family, crossroads has taken on a completely different meaning for me. In Ontario, it's like they're just built on a grid. Uh, They have streets that run north and south, and uh, then roads that run east and west. And they're concessions, and and you can be driving along in the middle of the country, and you'll come to a four-way stop. And you'll be at that stop, and you'll be looking around, and there's nothing. There's no houses, there's no stores, there's nothing but either cattle in the field or crops growing. And you'll be looking and you'll be wondering, why am I here? Why why am I stopped here? Why am I waiting? There's nothing coming. And you could sit there and wait a long time, looking for direction or looking for guidance and waiting to know which way to turn. In the midst of that, I've come to appreciate this notion that you can be at a crossroad in your life, in your journey, and you can be looking and looking and waiting to see what's coming down the road and anticipating what it is that God is going to invite you into. And so Jeremiah implores the children of Israel to go to this place of waiting. And in going to this place of waiting, there's two things that he encourages them to do. One is to find the ancient way. And the other is to find the good way. To find the ancient path. And he invites them to go and to be with God so that he can restore their soul. And he says, go find the ancient way. So when I hear the words ancient way relating to scripture and relating to a relationship with God, I'm immediately taken to the scripture in Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6 contains what's known as the Shema. This echoing call that Israel spoke every day. A reminder to them of to who they were in relationship with. And this is what it says, beginning with verse 4. Uh, We're reading through to verse 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. This call or this statement of Deuteronomy that reminds those who pursue God in a relationship are called to remember it and to delve into it, not just a little bit. We don't go to a pool and just dip our toe in and say, oh, wasn't that great? No, we want to jump into the waters to be refreshed and enjoy the moment. That's the same invitation to be in relationship with God in this Deuteronomy passage. It says, impress these on our children. Talk with them when we sit at home. Talk about them when we go on travels and on journeys. Make them the identifiers of your life and that this home is committed to these things. The ancient way is about reminding ourselves that we are in relationship with God. 
the God, the one and only Yahweh, whose son was Jesus, that the overriding impulse in our lives should be in a love relationship, reminding ourselves about our Father in heaven, his goodness, his faithfulness, and his love to us. We're called to remember this. And when Jeremiah invited Israel to go to the crossroads, he desperately wanted them to be reconnected with their faith, wanted them to be reestablished with the heartbeat and the passion that, that, uh, that they had once had. And instead of getting distracted by uh, these other issues in their lives about giving themselves to gain, to being greedy, and to being self-centered, he instead wants them to be rooted and focused in Jesus. Rooted and focused in faithfulness to God. Rooted and focused in the relationship with their Savior. So not only, though, did he invite them to go and discover the ancient way, to reestablish their relationship with God, but he also called them to find the good way and to walk in it. And when I think about what is the good way that we are called to walk in, what is the good way that we're invited to be a part of, I think of Micah 6. And in Micah 6, verses 6 to 8, another prophet says these words to the nation, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? to act justice, justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So here the prophet of God speaking to the nation of Israel says, what is it that God wants? How is it that God wants you to live? How is it that he wants you to interact with him? Does he want great examples of tithing? Does he want you to be the one in the church who gives the most? Does he want you to be the one who dresses the best and has the attention on you on a Sunday morning? Does he want you to speak with flowery language, being religious, and to have people look at you and say, oh, that person must be spiritual by the way they talk. That's not what he wants, Micah says. Micah says those who focus on these things are are off-centered. They're not walking the good way. And instead, he says the good way really is to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. I like to read those in reverse order because I think it starts with humility. And then I think out of our humility, it leads us to be people of mercy. And then out of our mercy, it leads us to be people of justice. You see, to be humble God's calling us to be faithful. To be humble reminds us that we have not earned our salvation, that we have not established the relationship with God, that salvation is a gift freely given by him. Humility means that I don't walk this face of the earth for my own personal gain, that I walk it with acknowledging my creator, my sustainer, the one who loves me. And out of that deep sense of knowing who I am before God and that he still loves me, he shows me mercy. I don't get what I think I might deserve. In fact, he gives me such grace that it overwhelms me, that he doesn't hold me accountable for everything that I should be because of the salvation through his son. He shows kindness to us. When I interpret mercy, I think of kindness, that it is a way of being kind to one another, not in opening the door for someone at, the, at, at a store, but living a life that is marked by kindness to all of those around us. For far too often, the church has been known for what it's against. 
The church has been known for who it seemingly hates. It's been knowing more about isolation and marginalization, not about grace and invitation not about what it's for. And if we are for anything, it is this good way that God has called us to walk into it with faithfulness and kindness. And out of understanding God's kindness to me, the kindness should radiate from me to everyone around me. And in that, I learned to do justice. I love the way that this is phrased, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk with your God, to act justly. It's to do justice. It's not just a one-time thing either, like kindness. It's not about maybe throwing a few dollars or coins into the, uh, the Salvation Army uh, Christmas campaign or donating some money on the uh, Christmas program to support those in your neighborhood. It's about developing a life and a heart that beats for those who are marginalized. To do justice is about a lifestyle of looking after those whose society has cast aside. Walking in a good way, not just one hour on Sunday morning or an hour Wednesday evening or your lunch break on Thursdays. But it's a 24-hour, seven-day yearly event to co- to foster in our lives justice in how we treat one another. And let me be honest, never before are we more aware of the unjust actions in our society, whether it be poverty, hunger, food insecurity, homelessness, addiction, racial inequity, gender inequity, economic inequity. Injustice is all around us. And it is our responsibility as followers of Jesus, as children of God, to speak into that in a way that makes a difference for those that we live around. A really good pastor friend of mine says this. He says, there's no reason for our church to get bigger if the community around us isn't getting better. A life that the church and individuals are called is to make a difference in the lives of those who are affected by injustice, to show them kindness, and to show them how we live in faithfulness, in humility with our God. So I don't know what decisions you may be working through in your life. I don't know what God is kind of challenging you with to make a decision about. But if you're like me and a lot of other people in this season of our lives, we have decisions to make. We have issues to resolve. We have relationships that probably need mended. And in the midst of that, God invites us to go down to the crossroads and to look, to anticipate that something's going to come along and helping us to make our decision. And as we do that, we find the ancient way we realize and reconnect and reestablish and throw ourselves into that relationship that we have with God, to love him with our whole being, our thoughts, our hearts, everything we have. And that as a result, as we wait, we don't twiddle our thumbs in the corner. We don't tap our toe to a beat that is off with the rest of the world around us. No, we engage in acts of justice, We engage in acts of kindness. We live a humble and faithful life to our God. So I invite you to join me at the crossroads as we wait for God to speak into our lives and to draw us not only deeper to him, but to resolve the questions around us. Let me pray for you. So God, we wanna thank you for this day the challenge in our lives to go to the crossroad, the challenge for us to pull aside so we can hear you speak into our lives. God, remind us of your love for us. Remind us of who you are, of why we follow you. Remind us of the sweet gift of Jesus. 
And Father, in the midst of that, propel us to be people of faithfulness. Propel us to be people who walk in humility, who act with kindness, and who do acts of justice. Lead us, O oh Father, we pray. In your Son's name, amen. Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne. Christ alone, cornerstone. Say 